I've been really thrilled recently, intrigued even, over the 21st chapter of Matthew. And I want to kind of go through a New Year's Eve discourse on Matthew chapter 21. And I just wondered exactly how I was going to get around avoiding reading the whole chapter. So I determined upon four verses starting with the 14th. That'll give you a good idea of what the chapter's about. And the blind. Chapter 21 of Matthew, verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying Hosanna to the son of David they were sore displeased and said unto him hearest thou what these say and Jesus saith unto him yea have ye never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise and he left them and went out of the city into Bethany and he lodged there. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he hungered. Lord, I thank you tonight for the reading of your word. Let it be rich and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, pierced to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Let it be a designer of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Let victory abide and faith arise and let the spirit and the word agree to set men and women free. I know that you're in this place. A host of angels is here too. Lord, we do not pray alone. We do not preach alone. The Holy Ghost is the preacher. And are not all your angels ministering spirits sent forth to minister unto everyone who is an heir of salvation? Oh Lord, let something supernatural touch every chair and that one who sits in it. I thank you for answers that arrive, for the victory that's ours. In Jesus' name, amen. How are you happy? He told the children of Israel this would be the first night, the first day of the first week of the first month of the first year of their brand new existence. What night was that? Passover night. That was the Hebrew New Year. And you know, life does not begin at 40. It begins at Calvary. Life starts out right at the point where salvation starts in. Hallelujah. Born once, die twice. If you're born twice, you may not have to die once. You will not ask to be born the first time, but you must ask to get born the second time. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, It'd be better never to be born than never to be born again. But you're looking at a new creature tonight in Christ Jesus. And this hope I have is an anchor of the soul, both steadfast and sure. Now here is the great uh, chapter 21 of Matthew. And Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on the coat, the foal of an ass. It wasn't a grand entry. Why said the Old Testament minor prophet, tell the daughter of Zion, that your king is coming meek and lowly, humble, sitting upon the coat, the fall of an ass. Now that little donkey had never been rode before, and Jesus must have had awful marvelous hands to control him. What a touch he must have maintained. Had no trouble riding a little coat that had never been broke. And you know, a young donkey is going to kick up its heels and act pretty bad sometimes. How many knows a few young mules like that? Hallelujah. Jesus controlled him fine and came riding in to the east gate. Since then, the east gate has been sealed up. How many realizes that it will be open again soon? But only one king will come riding back through it. The same Jesus that ye have seen taken up from you shall so come again in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. The angels told the disciples on Mount Olivet. Well, the first time he came through it, he was very meek and humble, but this next time he returns to Jerusalem and to this world with all the saints with him, it'll be in power, and it'll be in great triumph. It'll be in ruling the nations with a rod of iron and breaking them as a potter would break a vessel to shivers. Great authority shall he have when even the devil will fall down and say, hey, 
Jesus is Lord. Of all things beneath the earth, under the earth, above the earth, all things that was ever created is going to fall down and call him Lord. The devil's going to hate to do it, but he will have to admit it. So you see, he's been deceiving folks for a long time. He knows who Jesus is. Every time uh, Jesus came against some demon-possessed case, the spirits would cry out and said, We know you, Jesus, Son of God. Funny how the devil even knows him, and one day he'll have to admit him. Why the devils believe there's one God and they fear and tremble, the Scripture says. How many fears God tonight? You know, when you start to fear him, he'll come into the midst. He won't be here until you do fear him. That means bring every thought into captivity to Christ. That means forget about how the bells are going to gong at midnight, and how the confetti will be showered everywhere. Forget about what's on the late show. Forget about chewing gum and writing notes and wiggling. Uh, forget about letting your mind wander. Start fearing God and he'll come. And if we have to sit here till tomorrow night, we may have to sit here until we learn that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and that's how he enters in to the fearing of him. Some say, well, I don't want to be scared of God. You don't have to be scared of God. This fear I'm talking about is reverence to God. I'm not scared of the fire either, but I don't go sit in it. I reverence the fire. If I put it in his right category, it'll keep me warm, it'll cook my food. And if I put God in the right perspective tonight, he'll heal my body and set me free and give me the victory and save this old soul of mine. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. You may have lost the victory, lost the testimony, lost the anointing, lost uh, your temper. You don't just have to lose your soul. He's come to seek and save it. And the miracle of seeking is as big as the miracle of saving. He's out looking for you. And that doesn't mean you stumbled in here accidentally. He's been looking for you. That tug on your heartstrings at 7 o'clock said, leave the dirty dishes in the sink and get on down there. He's looking for you. Why, we didn't find him. He found us. He wasn't lost. We were. In fact, he doesn't even need us. We need him. And if we don't want to be God's child, the rocks can cry out and praise him. He can raise up children unto Abraham out of the stones, the Bible says. And here he's making a triumphal entry into the east gate. It is nothing like the triumphal entry that is to come. He was meek this time. He was lowly and humble, sitting on a little old mule, just been born, never been rose. And everybody was crying Hosanna, waving palm branches. But the second time he comes to earth again, he's going to be on a white horse. Ah, on his head many crowns. And his eyes a flame of fire, clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. Why, clothed about the tops of a golden girdle, an effort to down to his feet, feet burning like brass in a furnace. He speaks, seven thunders utter their voices, and sounds like the rushing of many waterfalls. On one shoulder is the government, is on his shoulder. On the other shoulder, there's a rainbow. Hallelujah. Why, he stands right in the midst of the river and stands upon it too. Hallelujah. And here out of his mouth goes a two-edged sword, and he slays everything that is anti-Christ. And I don't just mean the one-world dictator who is on the scenes whom we don't know yet, but soon will. Recently, one of the beetles got shot, and uh, this was the same beetle that Ten years ago, said he was more popular than Jesus Christ. I wonder how popular he is tonight. He's po probably very popular with the demons who are tormenting him and laughing at him. But Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh, but he hath nothing in me. Nothing to point the finger at. Nothing to claim me whereby. Nothing in here that he can call his own. Why resist the devil and he'll flee from you tonight when the enemy comes in? Like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord. Have you paraphrased that scripture properly yet? It is not the devil that's got the flood. It's the Spirit of the Lord that floods through me when the enemy comes in. Like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up the standard. Say praise the Lord. And ah, you can have a Noah's flood right here tonight if you want to. And nothing can stand in your way thereby. He rides triumphantly in. Has he ridden into your heart yet the same fashion? If he's not triumphantly entered into your heart, I doubt you see him in that day. 
For all the those that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin on the salvation. Are you looking for Jesus? Somebody said, I've got to get a new house and a new car and a new bank account and a new project and a new job, and I've got a lot of things to do. I can't afford to have Jesus come yet. You've lost the vision, friend. If you ever get to the point where you think the greatest things of this world could hold a candle to the tiniest thing in heaven, you're off the track. Next life is only a continuation of this one, and we are to pray even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And if you're already born again and have a new nature, and in your new nature you have no place in it that's looking for Jesus, there's something wrong with your conversion. And can you get regenerated the third and fourth time? Huh? Why? Whatever you've been uh, changed into, your new nature that has come to you, if it doesn't include looking for Jesus, something's wrong with your new birth. And I don't know how we're going to get that thing worked out of your system unless even tonight you cultivate a strong desire to see him. Hallelujah. I love him. Triumphantly, he's entered into my heart, therefore he will make another triumphal entry with me. For the army that sat on white horses with him were the saints clothed in fine linen, clean and white, which whiteness and righteousness is the righteousness of the saints. So I'm happy. He's going to make it different this time than the last time. But if you ever did it once, he can do it again. If you ever did it once, he can do it again. Aren't you happy? So he has ridden into the city, but nothing like he's going to be riding into the city and controlling the world. But I'll be with him, ruling the world, and so will you, who have let him triumph into your heart tonight and into your life this evening. Why, said the scripture, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. What will happen? The King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is the King of glory. Has he made a triumph for entry in your life? Let's see. How many has got the victory? I said, how many has triumphed? The Bible said, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. You're not triumphant until you've won. And that means you must overcome. You must be the one who uh, got the better, the best, and the upper hand of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Hallelujah. Well, triumphantly. Now the next part of the exhortation in Matthew 21 here on New Year's that gripped me is down here in the... Uh, Father down in the 21st chapter dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees who are watching Jesus every move he made. In fact, they were a little bit more than ordinary Pharisees. They were the chief, the chief culprits. I mean, the, the chief Pharisees. The religious hierarchy of the day was very upset when they saw all the children crying. Now, some churches you go to, you hear a lot of kids crying. But I thank God they got lungs to cry with. But this crying was different. They were crying Hosanna. And there's something about it. Every time the firmament moves, it praises God. The wind blows, it praises God. The flowers open up, it praises God. The sun shines, somehow God is getting the glory he has created. Hallelujah. Here stands all these little youngins just praising God, crying Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now they couldn't stand that. And they watched Jesus as he cleansed the temple. They couldn't stand that. But when he cleansed the temple, then he healed in the temple. You want healing tonight in your temple? What is your temple? The body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If any man shall defile the temple, him shall God destroy. Somebody said, I don't know why I'm dying of lung cancer. <coughs> Very simple. God is killing you because you are destroying the temple, defiling it. The body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If any man defile the temple, him shall God destroy. You forget that God is not only a savior, he is also a killer. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And he's not only a God of mercy, he's a God of judgment. And for judgment am I come into the world, said Jesus, to open the eyes of the blind and to blind the eyes of those who claim they see. Don't claim you know it all, got it all, and have it all tonight and can't learn no more. 
Don't be like the Pharisees who kicked that man out who was healed of his blindness and said, Thou wast altogether born in sins, thus thou teach us. It's impossible to teach some folks anything, but have a teachable spirit tonight. I learn something every time I go to church, don't you? Glory to the Lord. Now he claims this temple for the second time in his ministry. He'd done it before. Do you believe it needs to be cleansed once in a while? Do you believe that the little woman's coin is somewhere in the house? All you need is a good house cleaning. Who wants one? So here was a good house cleaning and she found it. Jesus cleansed the temple and there was no problem. As soon as the temple was cleansed of the money changes, those that sold doves, all those that were uh, making it a den of thieves and a house of merchandise and using the church for everything but its true purpose. Ouch. Hallelujah. I wonder why the preacher bends his ear. He's listening for a response. Amen, oh me, oh my, and one of whom will fix you. When he cleaned it all up, then he had no trouble, no problem whatsoever to heal in the temple. So I say if you get all your disobediences out of the way, plead the blood over yourself and get washed once more, make a new commitment to God, dedication and vow and covenant, and keep it this time. Hallelujah. I said, if you knock once more, because usually you give up five seconds before the miracle comes through, if you don't uh, get disturbed and panicky and just take it easy, let the Lord carry you through, don't get nervous, relax in Jesus, in his time, God's time, he will perform the work. I'm sure if you get a new hold on God and a new lease on life tonight, Tonight may be your hour. This is another chance to receive a healing or a miracle. Right here tonight. Hallelujah to God. For when he cleansed the temple, had no problem to heal in the temple. The blind came to him and they saw. All you that's lost the vision can get it back tonight. Instead of a crossed vision, you can have a vision of the cross and be Pentecost instead of plenty crossed. Hallelujah. Get your eyes anointed. One fellow got his anointed twice, and finally his distorted vision cleared up. Some folks are like that man who had one touch and confused themselves. But when he got the second touch, he saw clearly. How many needs one more touch tonight? And now you'll see things different, won't you? For he is in God. So the blind was healed. What is wrong with lame people? They cannot walk. Your walk can be restored tonight in the temple that is cleansed has a new lease on life, makes a new covenant for 1981, has a brand new contract with glory. You keep your part of the bargain, God will always keep his. The reason that he can't work with you and move in your life is because you keep breaking your part of the covenant. A contract is between two, and the first one who breaks his portion uh, cancels out the entire contract. And the more you can live righteous for God, the more God can trust you. Otherwise, you'll be shallow and superficial and just skimming the surface and getting by and uh, playing it by ear. But if you become more righteous, less like the world, more like Jesus, naturally he will entrust you with more of his power. That's a law of direct proportion, by the way. He cleanses it. He heals in it. Now the lame are walking. You look on your feet, you get five toes. Is that right? Ever wonder why you get five toes? There are five things that your feet are supposed to do for you. First, you're supposed to stand. How many, having done all, is going to stand? How many going to stand fast? Ah, in the liberty where Christ has set you free. And be not entangled again of any yoke of bondage. No man that warth entangleth himself of the affairs of this life, that he may please him who's called him to be a good soldier of the cross. Glory. The second thing you're supposed to do is walk. Is that right? Toe number two, walk in the Spirit, walk in love, walk circumspectly, ah, walk not as other Gentiles walk, walk worthy of the vocation whereunto you've been called, walk in the light as he is in the light, and have fellowship one of another. All thou hast caused me to walk upon thine high places. Thank God. How many wants to walk? Glory to God. The third thing in the third toe is for this. It's for running. When you stand, 
then you can walk, then you've got to learn how to run with patience the race that is set before you, looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Now, if you've run with the footmen and they've wearied you, what are you ever going to do when the horses and chariots start running? Oh, the way I've been here a little too long, I think. I've made it a couple of hours. I don't know. I'm getting a little bit weary. Well, we had not started running yet. The footman's walking around here. Hallelujah. But when the horses and chariots start going, you're going to hope that you can catch up. And if you can learn while God's moving slow, then you just forget about trying to follow it when he starts moving fast. You just be lucky to catch up with it. So running, it's here. I, I, you're a foolish Galatian, said Paul. You did run well, but who did hinder you? That you should not believe the truth. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? If you start off in the spirit, wind up in the spirit. There's folks that started off in the Holy Ghost and messed around and messed up and they're all still operating but off a different spirit now. Are you listening? If you've begun in the spirit, you'll never make perfect in the flesh. You must continue in the spirit. How long? Till Jesus comes. Someone got saved the other night, brother, buddy. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. And you're in a position of saving grace, too. But unless you endure to the end, you may not make it to the end. Hallelujah. When you want to brag, wait till you get to the gates and the pearly gates are locked. Then you can boast all you want on. But in the meantime, said Ahab, even in his backslid condition, he said, let not him that put upon the harness boast to see who taketh it off. I'm not out of this harness yet. I still got it on my back. I'm still pulling the load. Uh, my sufficiency is of Christ, and I can only boast in him. One day when I lay this armor down and I get inside the gates of pearl, I'll do a whole lot of clicking up my heels and breaking. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praising the Lord. Well, I love him. We are what? We are not only to stand and to walk and to run, but we're to leap. How many knows we're supposed to jump for joy once in a while? Why, by my God, I'll run through a troop and I'll leap over a wall. When God tells you to jump, you don't say, Oh, Lord, is it me? Do you want me to jump? Just say, How high, God, do you want me to jump? That's all he wants to hear. So you see, every toll increases the capacity. Is that right? You wouldn't do much if you only had two toes. But now you've got four toes at least. You can leap for joy. And the final thing is not only leaping, but we are to continue on and on and on and endure on to the very end. I love him, don't you? Glory to God. Say, I love you, Jesus. Glory be to God. He made my feet just like hind's feet. By my God, I'm going to continue running through this troop. Gad, a troop shall overcome thee. But thou shalt overcome at the last. It may take every devil in hell to get you down. But in the end, if you persevere, God will be on your side and he'll help you to overcome at the last. Hallelujah. Cork never sinks from the bottom of the sea. It may go down a few feet, but it always bounces back to the top of the briny deep. Hallelujah. So keep popping up. I said keep popping up. Glory be to God. I love him. Praise the Lord of hosts. The blind and the left, those who could not see, those who could not walk, they were delivered when the temple was cleansed. And quickly, as they came rushing in, they watched the wonders and were sore displeased. I believe God's going to do wonders here tonight. And it just might be that some people will be upset and displeased at what God will do. I don't know what their reasoning for it will be, because God loves the move. God will move and who will let him? Let God be true and every man a liar. If God be for us, who can be against us? Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. He wants to move because he's on the move. You've got to be moving to keep up with him. Hallelujah. But why these great religious people were so displeased with the children praising God, the whole city crying Hosanna. Why, lame were walking, blind were seeing, the scripture said, and yet they were so displeased and upset at what Jesus was doing now. Let's get happy tonight. Let's be filled of joy at what's about to happen. This is 
Just an exhortation to you on the first night of this meeting. To be happy and pleased. Without faith it's impossible to please him, but he that come upon the God must believe that he is. And if you have faith and believe that he is and that he's the reward of them that diligently seek him, he'll be pleased and you'll be pleased at what he can do for you. Hallelujah. But it seems like it could have been jealousy. It could have been envy, malice, right? You know, after all, they were supposed to be the established religion of the day. And here was one surpassing theirs, and that upset them. And some people can't see the forest, but for the trees. There's no man so blind as he who refuses to see. I mean, if it's scriptures in God's word and it happens, uh, woe is me if I oppose it. I'd rather go sit down and just let God move however he wants to move. Hallelujah. But not these chief priests. And these scribes, a scribe is one who studies the word, knows the tense, knows the sense, knows the letter. So exact is his dead letter that he too misses what God is doing in the spirit. It's the right combination of the letter and the spirit, or the Holy Ghost and the word of God. The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Hallelujah. So life is here for the asking. As they sit around, glory to God. So displeased, weren't just ordinarily upset, they were so displeased. And they took Jesus to task and said, don't you hear what these children are saying? Why didn't they pick on some adults? Why didn't they get a hold of some maturity? Why do they always take up an isolated case and class the whole thing into the same category over the odd thumb situation? Hmm? Why, a thousand good things can happen, let one bad thing happen, that's all you hear about. Communist news media gets a hold of it and blows it out of proportion and classes everything in the same category when you see what their purpose was for advertising it. Hallelujah. But they said, these children, isn't that awful? Well, since you're picking on that point, said Jesus, then let me speak to you concerning the children. If that's what's stuck in your car, have you never read... Most folks are mixed up because they've never read. And if you ever go into errors because you've never read the word. Hallelujah. Have you never read, said Jesus, that the psalmist cried out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. So no matter how it sounds, they're really praising God and God considers it perfect. When you do your best, that's perfect to God. You may not sound like much, but that's perfect to God. And as you continue doing it, you will grow and learn more and develop more, accomplish more. And someone said, don't ask me to sing. Don't ask me to testify. Go ahead and do what you asked. Do what you told. Who knows? You may get the gift while you're doing it. Uh, oh, God's working behind the scenes. He knows what's coming off. He knows just what to do if he can get a co-worker and get some response out of you. Hallelujah. Now uh, here we're going down this 21st chapter we find that the second category and the second point of the exhortation was the religious people were so displeased at the wonders. Can you imagine that? That blows my mind. Here's wonderful wonders and it upsets some people. Hallelujah. Well, he left town that day amidst all the palm branches, all the shouting. The whole city was moved. The Pharisees said, see how we prevail, nothing against him. The whole world has gone after him. I wish the whole world would. But he didn't stay reveling in the midst of all the praise and the glory, for he is on the move. He moved out the town and went to Bethany and spent the night. Hallelujah. One day he tried to escape uh, the crowd by getting out to the wilderness, but he could not be hid. There's no way Jesus can hide, really. He may spend a night in Bethany, but he'll be back in the morning. Hallelujah. And the next morning, Jesus comes back to the city, the city of Jerusalem, and there is not a soul on the street to greet him. O oh, thou fickle, fickle man. Hallelujah. Here he was back in the city again just the next morning. There wasn't nobody there to greet him. There was no hosannas. There was no palm branches. There was no children crying. Blessed is he. In fact, to empty streets he walked, looked around, and the Bible said he was hungry. He hungered. It's pretty hard. Somebody said to live a godly life. No, it's not. The way of the transgressor is hard. 
But you see, Jesus had it easy. Did he really? He was not used to walking in sandals and on rough, rocky roads. He was used to streets of gold. <laughs> Glory, are you happy? Why, well, uh, he wasn't even used to sleeping. He that keepeth Israel doth neither slumber nor sleep. Hmm? Yet he had to become flesh and become like you and I and be subjected to all things like as we are, yet he overcome them all, yet without sin. That wonderful. And he didn't like uh, to have to be hungry, but in the flesh he hungered just like you and I. And Why? When you have a glorified body, you don't even need to eat if you don't want them. Is that right? Why? He had to walk through the door when he would rather go through the wall. Say amen. amen. Oh, glory. So I'd say it was tougher on Jesus to live this life of the flesh than you and I, especially when he's lived it before us overcome everything he's on the other side helping us pulling us through giving us assistance i'd say we can do it we were born in it we're at least used to it he wasn't even used to it hallelujah but he overcome say amen especially we've got help from him who did it all well i'm happy glory to god here stands an empty town no hosannas crying no palm branches there stands Jesus by himself, hungry, hungry. Well, I believe he's hungry, not just for food, but for some more praise and worship. I believe he's hungry tonight for praise and worship. And it strikes me as funny concerning Tampa, Florida. Some of you aren't very old. Some of you are old timers. I guess we've had between 35 and 40 crusades in the city of Tampa over the last 20 years that we've been an evangelist. It's a strange thing to me yesterday there were a lot of people praising God. Just a day ago, relatively speaking. Uh, a lot of people on fire, a lot of people in revival, a lot of people uh, longing and thirsting after uh, righteousness, hungering after the supernatural. And yet, today, there's not a whole lot of those same folks still praising and crying, Hosanna. And Jesus is just the same today as he was yesterday. He's in the same uh, situation and the same spirit today as he was yesterday. He's back in Jerusalem this morning. And where's all those people gone to that testified so high and had such a shout and had such a testimony? Where are they? Where are all those palm branches? To empty streets he looks the next very day hungering hungering well if there's a hunger in heaven for more praise i want to satisfy that hunger now by saying thank you jesus glory to god forevermore hallelujah to the host praising the lord of hosts glory to god i love you jesus glory to god and when he comes up one street he looks upon a fig tree from the distance and in the midst of his hunger, he's getting happy because it looks so good. It's bound to have fruit on it. There's an awful lot of us that's awful pretty. I said, we look awful good. And we've worked on making it so. We've spent many hours at the Lady Maybelline counter. Hallelujah. Trying to buy beauty, which only comes in exchange for ashes. Why don't you put some sackcloth on you and sit in the heap and seek God until the glory shines on you and you won't have to advertise? You won't have to say one way or smile if you love Jesus or have another button or a bumper sticker honk if you love Jesus. Why, it'll shine right here where people couldn't even look on Moses' face because he'd been in the mountain with God. And they were scared to look and the veil was put over his face. And there's veils on people's eyes tonight, even sitting here, that cannot seem to peer and look into the glory. But it's there. Hallelujah. Glory to God. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. What a beautiful tree. But on its limb was nothing. It was a hypocrite. It looked good. It had no fruit. Now you know what a hypocrite is. A fruitless good looker. Hallelujah. God's only interested in one thing, and that's fruit. Production. Doing something. 
souls. Are you looking for people? Say hallelujah. Thomas and I wouldn't go down to New Testament church because there's a hypocrite goes down there. Well, they go to a lot of churches. Don't just pick out one to uh, grind your battle axe on. In fact, those same people that you won't go to church with, you go to McDonald's with, and you go to Kmart with them, and you go to Zares with them, and you go to the shopping center with you go everywhere with them, and, and just talk to them, and laugh, and joke with them, and carry on, except you won't go to the one place that might help them someday. It might just rub off on them some meeting. Hallelujah. Hypocrites aren't as bad as our believers. They have nothing to do with it. They won't come near the things of God. But at least a hypocrite will come here and listen and go through the motions and someday God will get a hold of them because they're in the environment. So praise the Lord. I believe that. But he looks at a tree beautiful. No fruit. He cursed the tree. Not by saying, I curse you, I cuss you, I swear at you. No. He just said, let no fruit grow on you evermore from now on. And instantly... The fig tree withered. Now, Peter didn't see nothing. The leaves looked the same. They still looked nice. But down at the roots, they had dried up. There's a lot of good lookers sitting here tonight that's dried up at the roots. Twice dead and plucked up by the roots. If Peter could have seen underground, he'd have seen that the thing withered underground. If he could have seen in the spirit, he would have known the life had just slipped right out of that tree. Got any life in you tonight? If the sap of the Spirit flows through you who are the branch, then fruit will be produced. Is that right? Glory to God, I love him. But he cursed the thing and the generation that stood with him, that is the disciples and all men who watched, lived to see the day that the fig tree nation died. Who is the fig tree? What nation? Tell me. All the disciples watched that nation die. 37 years from the moment that Jesus cursed the fig tree, do you know what happened? Whoosh. Titus, the Roman general, came in and destroyed Jerusalem. They were never seen since. Excuse me, they were seen again in 1918 as they started coming back. And recognized at the age of maturity, 30 years of age, in 1948, they were a world nation. Now they're back after 3,000 years as a self-governing nation, 2,000 years as a nation under the Romans. But there was no nation for 2,000 years. They're back, and the generation that watched Jesus curse that fig tree was alive when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. Jesus cursed it in 33 A.D. Now a generation is how long? 40 years, the number of testing. It is the number of the Jewish generation, 37. That's three shy of 40. So they lived to see Jerusalem destroyed, the same people that watched the fig tree wither. Now I say, and Jesus said in Matthew 24, that the generation that witnesses the revival of the fig tree, fig tree nation, who? Israel. The, na the people, the generation that sees that fig tree come to life again will likewise not die until Jerusalem is restored to life again. And it cannot be until Jesus comes to dwell there in Jerusalem. Are you going to go with him? Rather come back with him? Now, I'm not going to be so dogmatic to say that 37 years from 1948 it's going to happen. That would be 1985. No man knows the day and the hour. If I told you the year, I'd not be telling you the day and the hour. I can't even tell you the year. But I can tell you a generation that watched the fig tree wither lived to see Jerusalem wither. And the same generation that sees the fig tree come to life again will see Jerusalem come to life again. And it was our generation that saw it, and we are going to see it. It's coming in this generation. Do you believe that? Amen. Glory to God. 1918, the first Jew went back on the Balfour Treaty. 30 years is the age of maturity in the Bible. At age 30, the Jew became a nation in the world recognized by the United Nations. All right? From 1930, or 1948 to 1988 is 
the 40-year generation. I say that by 1988, the Jewish nation purpose, presence, and existence will have died, served its purpose, fulfilled itself, and God's got to do something else. That's what I believe. Hallelujah. Are you happy? Someone said, well, the Jew will never die. Yes, they will. There will be 144,000 of them that will escape the Antichrist, but when they see Jesus coming in the clouds, they will accept him and become Christians. They won't be Jews anymore. Hallelujah. They will have served their purpose. Are you happy? They will have outlived themselves, fulfilled themselves, and the next great thing on the ticket is the millennial reign of Christ. Are you getting ready for it? This is not a pipe dream. Twenty years ago, people said, hey, Jesus is coming any minute. Now we have proof they don't want to believe it no more. Something's wrong with us if we don't get excited about the fact that we're in the great day of the coming of the Lord. Are you happy? Glory to God. Wave your hand in great big victory. And say, I love you, Jesus. Praise in the Lord. Let me quickly finish up this chapter. I, I've been really intrigued by the chapter of the last, this past week. Here is a fig tree withered. I remember a little woman flew in to one of our Winter Haven crusades that we held in the tent for 10 consecutive years. Uh, one year she flew in from Iowa. She had cancer. She was the first one prayed for that night and she fell out in the sawdust and the cancer was healed and she stood and testified. Winter Haven and came every night. One week later, and that is because our meetings usually run around 10 nights when it comes to the tent, takes so long to put them up and down. A lot of hard work. <laughs> Revival is a lot of hard work. Don't think it isn't. Hallelujah. Uh, she said, my daughter called me today, and I said, well, how is she? Well, she had a bad spell. She got so sick, she could hardly stand, and she crawled to the bathroom and started vomiting up in the toilet. And she coughed up what looked like a whole bunch of old, dead, dry leaves. And after she coughed it up, within a few minutes' time, she felt all right and completely strong, much stronger than she'd been up until then for the past week. In fact, the week, next week I asked, how is she? She's doing better all the time, getting stronger all the time. And I couldn't help but think of the fig tree. That died the minute it was cursed. The life went out of it. The roots withered and shrunk up, but nothing changed on the outside. It was the next day when Peter walked by and said, Lord, how soon is the fig tree withered? What's wrong with you, said Jesus? It withered yesterday. He knows the end from the beginning. He calls those things which are not as though they were. Time means nothing to God. Why? What he's going to do in the next few minutes has already been recorded before the foundation of the world. So hallelujah. Aren't you happy about that? There is no time. Eternity is where he lives. And if God delivers you and heals you for five seconds or ten seconds here tonight, he can keep it done forever. It's strictly up to you. You can have what you want. Don't you believe that? God lives in eternity. Time don't mean a thing to him. Hallelujah. I love him. So the old fig tree dies and the leaves withered in 24 hours. If you don't get it all right tonight, wait and check on it again tomorrow. And see how much more improvement God has wrought in your life. Miracles are instant works of God. Healings are gradual and progressive restorations of God. Miracles can only be appreciated because it takes no time. Healing, which is gradual, builds your faith because it requires time. And it takes that time to exercise faith. Only time to exercise faith. And as faith is exercised, it gradually grows stronger. As you believe in every day, and you get a little bit more from God every day in your healing, you wind up with your healing eventually, and with great faith. Great faith which you would never have before. So miracles are instant, they can be appreciated. Healing is gradual, progressive, it builds your faith. Are you happy? All right, quickly, where are we at now in the 21st chapter? We're scooting down through here. And now comes the Pharisee. What authority do you have? Talk about stupid. Talk about out of their heads and out of their tree. What authority? Yes, what authority? By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? 
Now get a load of this. Here is some Pharisees that's watching the dead being raised, the blind eyes opening, the deaf ears on stopping, cancers and tumors falling off in the ground, and they're asking, what authority do you have? Why, you can see authority. You feel authority. His word was different than the Pharisees and scribes, for he spoke as one who had authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees. Why, when folks went home from listening to Jesus, they shook their heads and said, we've seen strange things today. Why, he do of all things well, make of both the blind to see and the dumb to speak and the lame to walk. My, with power and authority, he commands all unclean spirits, and they even obey him. Mercy. Why, what authority do you have? Now, you know authority when you get around it. Is that right? It won't be just vain words. It may not sound too strong and too overwhelming and too powerful, but if you just sit there long enough, you will notice the authority taking hold. Hallelujah. Again, you cannot rush the plan of God or what he's trying to do, even here tonight. Now, who gave you this authority? Funny that they didn't recognize authority when they saw it. Of course, a lot of folks are like that today. They won't listen to authority. But they didn't recognize it when they saw it. Now they didn't know what its source was or where it come from. Funny. If people get that way, why, they could be deluded into thinking anything. Why said a blind man who just got healed, hey, Mr. Pharisee and scribe, uh, what do you mean this man's a sinner? Why? Since the world began, has it ever been known that one could open the eyes of one born blind? If this man were not of God... He could do nothing. Oh, get out of here. You can't teach us anything. And they cast him out of the synagogue. Well, a lot of folks may get thrown out of your church for testifying about the supernatural. Healing power of God. Who knows? Hallelujah. They got rid of him. Didn't want to hear that. What authority do you have? And who gave it to you? Listen, if there's authority here tonight, you know it. You feel it. And you know where it comes from. It comes from God. If God don't do it, it's just not going to get done in this service. It has to be God. It's the Lord's doings are marvelous in our eyes. And coming down toward the end here, Jesus says this, the first are going to be last, and the last are going to be first. Aren't you glad? You may have thought, sure enough, I'm out of it altogether, but you may be in it before it's over. It's not over yet. Where well, there's life, there's hope. Where well, there's breath in your body, there is another chance. Say amen. He went out at the beginning of the day and hired men to work. He did it again at the third hour. He did it at the ninth hour. He did it at the eleventh hour, and that's the hour we're in. Is that right? At the end of the day, he passed out a penny to all. How come we've born the toil and the heat of the day? You've only give us a penny. Didn't you agree for a penny? You get just what you ask for. You can have just what you agree to, only what you pray for. If he promises you heaven, be thankful. And also be thankful if those folks that slipped in under the wire at the 11th hour, if they make it too. You ever catch a vision of hell, you pray to God that nobody ever goes there. You won't be jealous and say, hey, I've been serving God all these years and my mansion's not much bigger than this fellow that just got saved recently. Why don't you just go ahead and rejoice that that fellow even got saved? Hallelujah to God. They murmured against the good man of the house. Are you angry at me, said Jesus, because I want to do good? Are you going to make my good evil? <clears throat> Besides, it's my money. I guess I can do what I want with it. And I'm going to give it to whosoever will. <laughs> hey, sky's the limit. It's an open book. Whosoever will, let him come. God's not particular about who he uses because time's running out on him too. And he's going to finish his schedule also. And that means if you put forth the slightest effort, God will catch a hold of you and he'll use you. If you just give him half a chance, he'll use you. It's to his advantage to use anyone who will make themselves available to God. Do you believe that tonight? Yes. Hallelujah. The first son said, I'll not go to the vineyard. Afterward, he repented and he went. The other son said, oh, I'm going, Daddy, I'm going. But he never did go. Who did the will of his father? Oh, said the Pharisees, the son that uh, said he wouldn't, and he did. He said, therefore, the publicans and the harlots and the sinners and all the wicked shall go into the kingdom before you. Because you religious people said, hey, I got it. I got it made. I'm going to obey your God. I'm going to preach, teach, and witness. I'm going to pass out tracts. 
I'm going to prophesy. I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. And you hadn't done nothing yet. Sitting there on your Wednesday night chair, squeaking out a slight testimony. Save, sanctify, and fill of the Holy Ghost. Plop back down in your chair until you hear the next, the same routine next Wednesday night. You can be uh, saved and baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. And unless you do something with all this, you're going to lose even what you got. God knows no stopping place. You're going forward or backward. No such thing as holding your own. No such thing as a checkmate or a stalemate or sitting on the shelf. No? Listen. Unless you do something with that great testimony of yours, you won't have that testimony in a short while. You'll be back out on the streets. You'll be back out in the clubs. You'll be back out in the ditch where the blind lead the blind. You'll just be gone up the chimney like a puff of smoke. That's all life is, just a vapor. So if you are saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, sanctified, all these things that you've got from God, are you going to be selfish? Or are you going to give it away? Get out and work with it. Get out and use it. That's the only way it's going to stay alive. Because you'll just be turning into another denomination that's going through ritual. Every Wednesday night, save, sanctify, and fill the Holy Ghost. Save, sanctify, and fill the Holy Ghost. You're not even that no more. You backtrack because there is no stopping place. You're going forward or backward as far as God is concerned. Don't you want to make progress with a God who's on the move tonight? Hallelujah. I'm happy. So, the final parable he told them was this in the 21st chapter. He said, the householder planted a vineyard. Who's the householder? The Lord. Who are the husbandmen? You and I who have been committed to the harvest. We got work to do. We're the husbandmen who must first be partaker of the fruit. You've got to know what you're talking about before you can pass it on. You've got to experience it before you can endorse it. Hello? All right? I'm almost through here, and this is more of a study tonight than anything. Glory to God. We got a long way to midnight. We're going to have everything in its perspective and its proportion. People are going to be shouting at midnight all around Tampa. I think we should be able to out shout them. Come midnight. Hallelujah. Thank God. Are you happy? Don't you love him? Halaban Robohushai. The householder planted the vineyard. He gave it to us. My fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's given it to us. What are we doing with the great harvest? Somebody said, I hope I get a chance to testify Wednesday night. Listen, the field is the world. There are limitless horizons. The whole wide world, of which I don't even think 1% is saved, uh, needs Jesus. And they need you to find him. So, householder has given you, the husbandman, the run of the vineyard. It's yours to do whatever you want with. Now, let's do something with it. Now, the third main character of this parable was the servants. They came by one day to visit the husbandmen. You believe God sends a servant by once in a while to visit the husbandmen? I say the caretakers of the vineyard. What is that purpose of that servant anyway? He's come looking for fruit. The Lord has sent him to pick up some fruit to take back to the Lord, to take back to heaven, to take and give to the householder who planted it. Who plants the vineyard and doesn't eat of it? Uh, who milks a cow and doesn't drink a quart? Hmm? Why, uh, even the ox is not muzzled. He eats a little of the corn that he treads out with his own feet. Huh? Why, nobody goes to war of his own charges. Nobody uh, uh, does anything unless they are partaker of that thing. Right? That's what they live by. And who is going to plant a vineyard and not expect some fruit out of it? The Lord's done an awful lot of creating. Now he wants some returns. And you're the one entrusted with the vineyard. How about it? I feel like a servant tonight looking for some fruit. I may not be a good discerner of spirits, but I can be a good fruit inspector. You don't get peaches off a pear tree. You watch a person long enough, see what they do, you'll know if they're any good or not. You can watch them, and after you study and uh, keep uh, notes, take notes on them, uh, if they're not too good, they're corruptible, they're going to bring forth corruptible fruit. But if they're a good tree, they'll bring forth good fruit, Jesus said. 
Well, I'm just kind of looking around tonight. I've reached that stage of the meeting. Hallelujah. I may have to add a few things to my report. Well, after all, he sent me looking for food. I'm just a servant of God. And you are the husbandmen of the householder's vineyard. And I've got to take your report back to glory. And when I go to prayer, I've got to mention you. I hope I can say good things. Most of the time I have to pray hard for good things for that person. Hallelujah. I have to pray hard for them that they will be spared, but I'd rather get some fruit out of the vineyard to carry back tonight. Hallelujah. Now, what happened in the parable? Every servant that the Lord sent, they kicked him, they whipped him, they stoned him, they threw him in jail. Hello. Finally, the householder, who was God, couldn't stand it no more. He sent his only son. He said, surely they'll reverence the son. But when they saw the son come, and said, ah, here's the heir. Let's kill him in the vineyard of the hours. So they even killed the son. How many knows they did? Hallelujah. Ooh, glory. <laughs> Lord, now, said Jesus, what will the householder do to those husbandmen when he returns to earth again? Oh, said the Pharisees. Why, he will miserably destroy those wicked husbandmen and give that vineyard to somebody else. You prophesied your own doom, said Jesus. Your own mouth has committed you. By your words, friend, you're justified or you're condemned. You know, you predict your own future many times just by the things that runs out of your mouth. He said, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Thus shall God take the kingdom away from you, Israelites, and give it to another nation that will bring forth the fruits thereof. God doesn't care who gets the kingdom just as long as he gets some fruits. He'll give it to a nation that will bring forth the fruits thereof. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And we uh, don't have to be God's people, but he will have a people someplace. There are ten lined up to replace me, and any one of the ten can do a ten times a better job of it. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel, said Paul. If I preach it willingly, I have a reward. If it's against my will, I can't wiggle out of it. I've got to preach it anyway. I just lose my reward. Oh, God, help me to be willing to preach to these people tonight. Hallelujah. Well, I'm happy. Are you happy, Sal? I love you, Jesus. The third time, and in the voice of three witnesses, every word shall be established. The third time he spoke it, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. This nation was first, it's going to be last. And I will give the kingdom to a nation, any nation, that will bring forth the fruits thereof. I still see John the Baptist at the bank, baptizing, saying, Repent, kingdom of heaven is at hand, and bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. What does that mean? That means don't just repent, but act like you repented. Let your fruits prove that you have repented, which means not sorry you got caught, but sorry enough to quit. It means they're turning away from godly sorrow, work of sorrow on the sa salvation, not to be repented of, the sorrow of the world, work of death. You can be sorrow over the, sorry over the things of this world, and you'll still die. But godly sorrow turns you away from all wickedness. Hallelujah. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first, depicted in the eleventh hour vineyard parable, in the two sons parable, and in the householder, husbandman, servant, and fruits parable. Hallelujah. Three times proven in Matthew 21 that even though you feel like the tail, someday you may be the head. Are you happy? <laughs> you don't have to take it laying down before this thing's over. There's going to be a lot of folks in glory you thought would ever make it. There's going to be a lot of folks that you'll be looking for saying, surely they'd be the number one folks here. They're not even going to be there. Well, there's hope. Aren't you glad for Jesus tonight? New Year's coming. There's a lot of hope. While the old one's winding up last, the first may be first in a few minutes on January the 1st. Hallelujah. I love him. Now, in conclusion, the last verse of the chapter said this. The Pharisees and chief priests perceived that he spake these parables against them. Oh, thank God for small miracles. Thank God for revelation. Thank God for penetrating the thick skull. 
Thank God for finally doing something to gain attention. One old farmer had to hit his mule between the eyes of a sledgehammer just to get his attention. When the whole chapter finally wound down, it dawned on those thick-headed religious hierarchy know-it-alls that he was speaking about them in his parables. Boy, talk about intelligence and understanding. Talk about insight. Well, I hate to tell you this, but has anybody perceived yet that I've been preaching at you tonight? Has it dawned on you that this old preacher is coming right down your alley? Hallelujah. Am I on your street? Am I close to your address tonight? Hallelujah. If it has crashed upon your consciousness that maybe Brother Freddy's preaching at you tonight, you're right. I told you before, I haven't come to preach to the walls and to the empty chairs. I'm preaching to you. And if you can see yourself in these parables, and in Matthew chapter 21, the whole chapter, more power to you. If I shoot for the stars, I'm bound to hit the clouds. I'm looking for progress. In fact, fruit tonight. I hope I can get a little to pass on to the Lord from your life for all that God has done for you and committed to your trust. Oh, Lord, don't let me see any barren fields as I'm about to minister here. As a servant, let me find husbandmen who have fruit to offer, lest you take this kingdom from this congregation and give it to anybody who will bring forth fruits. All fruits meet for repentance. Repent, and then act like you repented. Don't just get forgiveness. Repent. Hello? There's folks that go to penance. And they uh, go through catechism and go to mass and they're getting forgiveness. They're temporarily being alleviated from their sins until tomorrow they can get back at it again. Repentance means turning away from sorry enough to quit. And your actions or your fruits will prove that, that you have really done that. Are you happy? Now do you love the Lord? Amen. Brother Norris, come. This may not be high-powered preaching, but not every preaching sermon will allow you to shout on earth. You don't shout over every sermon preached down here. We've had lots of shouting sermons in this church. We needed one to uh, postpone our shouting tonight. But you shout over there rejoicing that you heard a sermon. That made you line up so you could get over there. Now you can shout forever. Hallelujah. If you're happy, say I'm happy. Jesus breaks every fetter. Let the triumphal entry enter your soul now. Number one. Jesus breaks every fetter. Be amazed. Be overjoyed at the wonders. Do not be displeased of the wonders. Point number two. Every fetter. And he said, be free. Don't be a fig tree nation that's barren and cursed. Jesus is coming in this one that has seen its restoration. I will shout hallelujah. I will shout hallelujah. Ooh. I will shout Point number four, what authority? You mean, you saw all these miracles and you don't know that there's any authority around here? Where did it come from? You don't know it come from God. And he sets me free. Finally, the first or last, and the last or first. It's been proven how I many it's hard at work now. Put your shoulder to the wheel. You'll get out of this just what you put in this. Glory to God. If you don't want to produce nothing right now at all, there is a nation who will produce the fruits. And that nation will receive the kingdom. And nations are consisted of people. People makes up nations so it can be boiled down to your individual life. He sets me free. Mm -hmm. Glory to God, I need thee. Oh, I need thee, oh, every hour I need thee, 
Oh, bless me. Bless me right now. Oh, bless. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour. Stay Thou close by. Temptations lose their power. When you're walking close by my side, sing it now. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour. Every hour. I need thee. Oh, bless me. Oh, bless. Me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. Thank You, Lord. Thank God. Lord, much time awaits us. Have Your own way. And on this first prayer of faith, answer prayer, and on every continuous prayer of faith, continue to confirm the word mightily. Let these wonders not displease anybody, but let everybody get happy over them. Oh, Lord. And Lord, Tampa used to rejoice. Do they still rejoice on the morrow? And yesterday, things were a little different, and time has changed, lots of things. But today you're hungry for more praise than hosannas. Will you find barren trees that look good with no fruit in Tampa? Or will you find people who are babes offering perfect praise? I'll let the whole city be moved once more. Let the religious hierarchy be upset that the whole world has gone after him once more. Let the streets be filled with people shouting and praising the great graces of God. Oh, Lord, don't let it be a bleak and barren morning when you look up and down empty streets and find no one who doeth good, no, not one. Oh, are we like sheep have gone astray. But Lord, I thank you now. You're winning some back. My first prayer of faith tonight. I want to pray for everyone who would like to have a triumphal life a triumphal entry of Jesus Christ come winging and swinging into your soul. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. He will come in. He that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. He's under obligation to come into your life if you open up to him tonight. Repentance means turning away from sorry enough to quit. That's the only thing that keeps him from living there and staying there. Your iniquities separate you from God. Hallelujah. My first prayer of faith is for souls. Miracles will follow. Healings, deliverances, victories. Not important at all. Not, not the least important to God are those things compared to souls. Some of you may be so stubborn, I'll have to come and get you by the ear to get your soul saved tonight. You know, Brother Freddie kind of does that. He goes and prays for who he wants to when he sees the green light. Hallelujah. But right now and tonight, my first prayer is for souls. Even if you're a step off the path, one degree off the mark, not what or where you need to be. God wants you there and feels you ought to be if you're going to be accepted of him. Tonight, you've not had much triumph and victory. Let him in again. Let him in again. I'm praying for souls. Everyone that needs a jolt, an encouragement, a strengthening to your spirituality, rise for the first prayer. This is the first prayer for souls. Praying for souls. The spirituality of the soul. Hallelujah. The regeneration of the soul. The healing of the backslidings of the soul. The setting aflame once more of the lukewarm in the soul. Hallelujah. Stand again, those who haven't yet, that needs to have your soul restored. Complete restoration tonight. Give it back to the one who can take care of it. 
quit trying to run it yourself and lead your own life. Let the Spirit of God lead you. Hallelujah to God. Blessed be the Lord. Of all the people standing, there's another half that probably should be, and we'll have to go get them by the ear. Uh, I'd rather you stand. That way it's strictly by choice, and I know it. God doesn't want to force nothing on anybody, and I don't want to paint an awful hot picture of hell, although it's hot. I'd rather you get saved because you love him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Our sufficiencies of Christ tonight. I feel the yoke being broken, the Spirit of God penetrating, coming a little deeper now. Halabahashai. Lola Papandrosi. Glory be to God. If you can receive it. It's only God that put these folks on their feet. New Year's coming. People expecting Jesus might show up this year. You know what? According to the timetable, and according to Scripture's good possibility, tribulation could start this year. said there's that good possibility. I didn't say it would. I didn't say when we're going up, but we're out. we are going up. Don't get me wrong. We are going up. I just don't know when, but we're going up. And we're going up alive with no scratches on us. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Lots of things are going to come, lots of pressures, but it's going to make us what we ought to be. Anyone else wants to stand and join this group, I wouldn't let New Year's come without salvation. Hallelujah to God. You can go to some churches for a year and never see three people stand on their feet to get saved. Did you know that? There's quite a crowd standing right now tonight. Did you know in less than an hour, Greece will be the tenth horn of the beast? Did you know that? It'll be part of the common market of Europe, the old revived Roman Empire, in less than one hour. January the 1st, 1981, there'll be ten horns on the beast. Say hallelujah. They're trying to bring Spain in, and then they're going to call a limit to it. Watch what happens when eleven horns appear. Somebody said there are not eleven horns. Daniel saw eleven. He saw a little horn crawl up among ten horns and speak great swelling words. Watch this fellow that brings Spain in. That will end the common market. The Roman Empire will be complete. Ireland and Denmark, and maybe Luxembourg, I think. Three little horns, uh, something of this nature, were not originally a part of the Roman Empire. And when this little horn brings in his... Uh, kingdom. This military leader or whoever this is that makes, brings in Spain or makes the thing complete, he's going to rip up three horns. They're going to be destroyed and then there'll be seven kings and he'll be the eighth. Eight is the number of new things. It's happening fast. I'm still waiting for a few more folks to rise for salvation. Before I pray the prayer for the soul, I want to tell you one last thing. This is most pointed and potent to me. I've been on the plane all this year, almost every night, all over the country. Crusades. When I was in Illinois, Missouri, I heard this. When I was in Maine, I heard this. Last month in San Antonio, Texas, I heard this, what I'm about to tell you. From at least a dozen sources, I've heard where people receive negotiables by computer era. And on each of these, up in the Manitoba, British Columbia, there was a woman got a $500 savings bond. She went to cash it. Same thing happened to the bond as happened to the stocks, Social Security and welfare, currency. I used to think it was all cashless credit, and we've had that for five years anyway. Hallelujah. But it's everything. But none of it can be used. Here's the catch. Here's the catch out. None of this can be used. On the back, or on some part of the face of every one of these negotiables, in red print, it said, This is not negotiable unless the bearer 
has a number in their forehead or in their right hand. Now I've heard this all fall from 12 to 14 sources. And it's all type of governmental or paper negotiables. Non-negotiable unless you too are numbered. Your body is numbered. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. Now, let me finish. They rushed this thing to the bank president or to the head of the monetary establishment where they got it. And the fellow, invariably, the testimony was the same. The fellow would snatch it and run to the back room and come out of another one and not say anything. But persistent as these Pentecostals are, they said, we want to know what that means. And all the answer they could get was this. Glory to God. The only answer they could get was this. This was sent out by computer error. Amen. It was not to be issued until 1984. It was always 1984 in every testimony that I heard. And in several counts, several of the testimonies, it was August of 1984. Now, friend, that's speaking about enforcement. When you can't even spend your money without having a mark on you too, corresponding with the money, not the same number. Have you seen, well, in San Antonio, one woman came to my crusade. She was three of, she was one of three bank officials. And the uh, no ordinary bank folks knew nothing about this, but she was one of three that said that is the truth. We're not allowed to talk about it, but where that boy ever got that information, I'll never know. After church, she came up and told me that uh, about a million dollars worth of currency with the new numbers printed on the bottom had been issued by a computer error and they were trying to get them all called back in. And on each of the bills was the same red print. This is not negotiable unless the bearer has a number in their forehead or in the right hand. Now in weariness of the flesh, tired and weakness, I tell you these things tonight. I've run smack dab into it, and after a while you'll hear that same testimony from so many different parts of the nation. It makes you wonder. The monetary establishment of the world is on schedule to enforce marks upon the body in 1984. Whether God upsets the apple cart or he allows them to do as they have planned is not for me to say. But I'll tell you this, it's just about on schedule for the timetable. You know why? Because the Antichrist does not enforce marks until the middle of the week. When he breaks the covenant of the Jew, sets up the image that speaks by demon power, destroys the world church, and claims to be God, he says, now take this mark. It is not only to buy and sell, but it is also in allegiance to the worship of a man. That part they won't tell you right away. Right now they're saying it's only to buy and sell. And they're going to fix it so that you cannot buy nor sell unless you have a number two to go buy laser beam tattooed upon your body. They say buy and sell, but it is also in allegiance to a one world leader. And that is taking your soul out of the hand of the real Christ and putting it into the hand of the Antichrist. For that there is no forgiveness but damnation for eternity. A hell forever for that person who receives the mark of the beast. When they start wanting to put marks on your body, you call a screeching halt to that thing. I used to think it was all cashless credit. No. Uh, we've had that. This lady told me that they're going to use money. It has its own, every bill has its own special number, and they already have it in Canada. I've seen the bills. People, don't, people spend them don't even know that the number's down at the bottom. It's a computer number, just like it's on the bottom of the products in the grocery store. It's on their bills. It'll be on American money. They will use money, except you can't spend money unless you have a number by which to spend it. Oh, saith God, this night stir thyself and shake thyself, and look not to flesh and to man and to the arm of the natural, but look unto me, for I alone have all power and strength. I can give thee encouragement, I can lift thee up, for thou art marked by me, saith God. I have my brand upon thee, I have stamped thee with the stamp of my approval, for I have given thee the Holy Ghost. And this Holy Ghost shall be with you always, even to the end of the world. I will never leave thee. And this is my mark of approval, for my spirit cannot come upon sin. Yea, this is the seal of thine inheritance. 
Ah, by this thou art sealed unto the day of redemption. Thou hast my spirit, saith God. My mark is upon thee. Ita bahasha. Hasala mahasa. glory to God. Rababam sasremai. Thank God. This is what the world's planning to do to the world. My God's working too. Don't ever forget that. And he's never lost a battle on the other side of the scenes. Anyone else needing to get saved tonight, I now wait for you to rise to your feet. Time's running out. I can't see beyond the next four years. I've preached that for quite a while. That'll be 1984. I can't, I, we may hear, be here beyond it. I don't know. I know in the meantime, as weak as frail as I get in my old body, I'm determined to preach every night and day two of a half to until he comes. And I have all eternity to rejoice that I put it in high gear and kicked it in overdrive and did my dead level best in the last few moments of time. Hallelujah. I'll, I'll rejoice then. I'll be weary now, but I'll rejoice then. Are you happy? Glory to God. I'm waiting for more that wants to go with me. Heaven's where I'm bound. I need a few more to rise for the soul and have prayer for it. Hallelujah to God. I'm going to pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lift your hands above your head as we pray. And pray with me this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, hear my cry tonight. Let me be worthy to escape that hour of temptation which is coming on all the world like a snare. Oh Lord, save me tonight. Wash me in the blood. I repent of every sin. I make a start for glory. It begins at the altar of repentance. I'm sorry enough to quit. Come in my life to stay. Let me receive regeneration today. I thank you for salvation. For my name in the Lamb's book. Come in my heart, Lord Jesus. God be merciful to every sin. Put your mark on me, Lord. Seal me by thy spirit. Protect me by your power. Let me be ready should you come tonight. I believe you've heard my prayer. There's peace. There's a joy. There's a brand new cleanness entering my heart. Condemnation seems to have lifted. My conviction doesn't bother me no more. But I feel wondrous. Great grace is in my soul. Something's happened. Heaven has begun.